Hello, hello everybody. How are you doing? I hope you're doing really well. I've just realised that looks really weird. I put my treat jar up there behind me, but it's kind of floating in the sky. How odd. <laughs> I shall just remove it for you. <laughs> I will eventually get somewhere that's a little bit closer, so it's actually scannable for you. See? There's a QR code that you can scan. That's for sending me tips on coffee. Coffee as in ko fee, the um, website. <laughs> just hint, hint. Kind of. I'm just doing a little bit of streaming housekeeping here, which um, um, I had started to do, but not actually got any further with just before I actually started the stream. Sorry about that. I'm just going to finish cleaning that up and then I will say hello properly. Yeah. Yes, that is my keyboard. It is that loud. <laughs> Eventually, I will actually have my microphone, this thing here, on a nice stand that is not connected to where my computer is, i.e. not on my um, keyboard tray. So therefore you won't get as much thumping and clacking and banging going on. Um, anyway, that hasn't happened yet. Eventually it will. So what's up with you? Where are you? How's it going where you live? I hope you're well, wherever in the world you are. I hope you're not overwhelmed by heat at the moment because I'm aware that it's rather hot in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, here in New Zealand today, the part of New Zealand that I'm turning around to look out the window down there, the lower level of the house, I can see down onto the front lawn, one corner of the front lawn. Um, the sun's not shining, but it's not cold because I think there's a bit of cloud in the sky, which means that we have a bit of more comfortable weather. We did have the fire going this morning because it was a little cool when we got up, but other than that, we're good. So there you go. Um, what have I got to tell you about? Is there anything new? Can't think of anything right at the moment. Right, so, hi, I'm going to just introduce myself to the new people here. Hi, I'm Jeff. I read old children's books. Yes, old. Such as, I'm just reaching underneath my magic screen behind me, such as this. This old book was made, created, printed, given to somebody, that's the word. Uh, I'm just going to calculate it for you. Um, because I should actually know these numbers and I keep forgetting them. So, when in doubt, pull up the calculator on your computer. This is if you're on a computer, not a phone. Um, just checking this. I shall tell you how old this is. This book is confirmed. I've done it with the calculator. This is over 125 years old. And no, I am not wearing cotton gloves. I'm not protecting it from, from too much special too much harsh light, etc. Just because it's a, a, an ordinary book in my house. It was given to my grandmother's brother. Her older brother, well, all of her brothers were older. She was the youngest in the family. That's how life goes. It's old enough that the pressure from printing the book has actually made indentations on the page, and I can feel those indentations when I run my fingers over the page. And I thought I had sorted out my computer auto-correcting for brightness on the screen. I did it in one place. Obviously, there's something else I still need to change. I have no idea why it's doing that, but it is. It's not meant to autocorrect for how bright the screen is. I don't know. Maybe there's another uh, setting somewhere I have to adjust. I'm sure there is. Anyway, so I read old children's books, and I read them because initially it's because what I ha they were the books that I had. They were the books I grew up with. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is feeling a little bit uh, not tired, just I'm, I'm 
my, mentally I'm still sort of waking up for ha from having done a whole lot of business admin stuff and discovering a whole lot of ants somewhere in the house and all sorts of other just general irritating things that happen. Right, um, so the books that I grew up with were old books, not necessarily as old as that one, um, anywhere between 75 and 125 years old I suppose. Um, and they were the books that we had in our house. We had newer books as well, but they were, I, we specifically had those in our house because my parents and my grandparents, um, none of us had a lot of money, but when you were gifted a book for some special reason, whether it's a birthday, a Christmas present, for doing really, really well at Sunday school or at school or anything like that, generally you held on to them because they were expensive items. And at some stage or you would get bored enough that you would read it. So that's how I got into reading old books was we had these books around. And so it's like, oh, I wonder what this is. The pic the cover looks a little bit different to, to the modern books we have at school. And I've read all the books that I brought home from the school library. So often they would have, the old books would have... Um, the cover illustration and title would be punched into the cover so that they are recessed slightly, the opposite of embossing, um, I think. Isn't embossing where it has a bump and these are the ones where it has a dip. But this, they, they also would put a little bit of gold in, probably not real gold, gold coloured metallic finish into some of the letters just to catch your eye. If it was a really special book, then the edges of the page would be marbled, which means it has a swirly pattern on it out with various colours. This one doesn't, but I have read books that did. Some of them would even have marbled end papers. End papers are the pages where the, the, the first and the very, very first and the very last page are actually glued to the back of the cover to hold the main text of the book, this bit here. This bit here is held into the cover because the end papers are glued in. Um, and so that whole spread there would be marbled paper. And yes, I have actually grown up with some of the books I read were those style of books. Um, what else about them? They have a particular smell. I'm not quite sure. It, it's neither negative in my, in my opinion. Um, but I remember picking up books and smelling them. In fact, my daughter got into trouble with somebody once for picking up some books and smelling them. Just because that's the way we respond to books. It's a, it's a whole body experience. It's the smell of them. No, we didn't taste them. It's the smell of them. It's the feel of them. It's the sound of them when you turn the pages. Like that. Um, as well as what they look like. Um, they often had odd to our mind illustrations illustrations that were about things that you wouldn't expect like this child running away from a bull in the street somewhere wow why on earth is that happening that's very intriguing and it gets you wanting to read but also the children would be wearing clothes that were nothing like the clothes that you were used to so here they are um, and these would have once upon a time actually been just normal clothes for children of the particular um, financial class that they were. And I say financial because um, what you what you bought, what you owned was based on, the, the sort of lifestyle you lived was based partly on how much money you had to be able to do other things with it. And yes, originally it was based on a class system. But, uh, I mean, if you go to the States, uh, the class system over, they have a strong class system. But it's actually based around finances. It's just the way it is. Anyway, so um, I grew up with all these old books and read them. I, so I read my parents' books and my grandparents' books. Not just a book that was the same title and text as one that they had grown up but the actual physical copies that they had read because we kept the books because they were too precious to us and there's nothing wrong with that um but we also later on when I was growing up a little bit more we would be given other books as presents they would be brand new books paper 
mainly paperback books but other things like that so it just sort of fostered this whole attitude towards books and then on top of that I discovered that books were magic you could read these little black marks on the page and what the author was thinking of a variation of that specific to you would be drawn in pictures inside your head and you would hear the things that they were talking about and sometimes you would even smell and taste the things that they were writing about. I think that's a form of magic where somebody can transfer what's in their head into yours. Yes, it will have a variation to what they have specifically imagined because it will be based off your own life experiences. But on top of that, your imagination gets stretched and because it gets stretched, the way you respond to the world also gets stretched. You learn how to, how to be more considerate of the way other people live and think and act on things because you have, through someone else's words, experienced these things. You've experienced what it might be like for somebody from a different place at a different time. And I think that's actually something that we really need to get more in touch with in ourselves is the fact that um, other people's experiences are their valid experiences. We are not to go around negating what has happened to them. We need to accept it, respect it, and if appropriate, actually be supportive of them in working through some things that they may need to work through. Or make, doing something to change the way the world functions in certain areas because it's inappropriate, because in how it treats a whole group of people or individuals for whatever reason, whether it's their life circumstances, whether it's their health, whether it's their mental health, all of those things, we can come to a broader understanding as we read because we start to experience life from someone else's point of view. We start to experience the life that that person, whether it's real or, or imaginary, actually is having. And this is part of the magic of words. So that's that's part of the background for me with words. Um, also, I like the fact that... that um, I have this this pool of, of books that are familiar and then authors who are familiar but because I haven't read all their books I can actually have the delight of discovering other books that they have read and enjoying those. Um, but a lot of older books are no longer available unless you get them as ebooks and download them onto a device of some sort. So this is my iPad mini, my first generation iPad mini, which was gifted to me as a second hand item. And I love it because I can read, I can put lots and lots of books on it and take it with me somewhere without having to have a suitcase full of dead trees. I love, <coughs> excuse me, tickle up my nose, probably from sniffing books. <laughs> I love physical books. I love the feel, the, sp the smell, the sounds, as I've already talked about. But I also like the convenience of being able to take a book with me to another place um, and not be weighed down by, by hundreds of kilos of, of um, physical objects that would, would be very inconvenient. Uh, if you have ebooks, then you can take them with you and you don't have to only take the books that you want, that you know you want to read. Have you ever been somewhere? You've, you've taken a book with you thinking, oh, I'll read this while I'm away because I've got some time off. You get there and you open the book and you go to read it and you think, oh, I can't be bothered with this one. Why didn't I bring the other one? Well, ebooks are your friends um, you have the opportunity to take a whole lot more books with you and you don't have to make a decision specifically about only taking this one and that one you can take a whole lot of them and they don't take up a lot of extra physical room as long as you've actually got a big enough brain on your device um, I did a lot of traveling in 2017 and 2019 where I didn't actually have a lot of internet access but I had loaded a whole lot of books on my phone that was a device I used then when I was traveling I had four months at a time for each of those trips and had my this resource all these books I could read ones that I had borrowed from the library that would auto return when they would got to the end of their loan period but also ones that were ones that I owned the copy of because I'd got them through Amazon or 
wherever else that I had bought them or even public domain ones such as the ones that we use here. So hi Jonathan, great to have you here. Um, Jonathan's another person who reads old things. One of his one of the things that he's doing at the moment is Jonathan is reading Elizabethan Tudor Elizabethan Tudor period um, documents, letters, court records, all these things amassing all this information about how people had been living and interacting around certain uh, actual things that were happening in history at the time. That's why I say letters and court documents. Um, and he's got in mind that he's going to he's he's working on a game that references that is based out of these factual things happening and so he's do, spending a lot of time reading this sort of stuff as well as doing whatever else it is that he does with his actual normal day-to-day -day, um, job type life <laughs> and I'm just going to give him a um, A shout out here so that if you haven't been and um, he, he plays games and other things like that too I'm sure most of the people I know on Twitch do um, you can go over to Jonathan's channel and you can follow him and even subscribe and then Twitch will actually let you know when he is live next I'm doing well thank you for asking Jonathan that's great lovely to have you here um, just just introducing myself to all the new people who haven't yet arrived but will actually be looking at this a little bit later on because I do know that most of my viewers are actually um, recording viewers rather than live viewers they don't realize what they're missing out on because they don't actually get to interact in the chat at the time but that's okay we'll let them off this time um, another link I am going to give you is a project Gutenberg now that's the place where I get a lot of these ebooks that I read because they are public domain books. Um, I only read public domain books these days except for when I have very special permission to be able to read a book that is specifically um, given to me as permission so that I can read it in this public setting for you. Um, I have one book that I read like that recently and I got this, the permission from the publishers to be able to read it here on Twitch and to load the video from that reading over to YouTube but because YouTube has a lot more people and interaction in good and bad ways the book isn't available generally through searching but you can actually request a link to see it as an unlisted video so you can always um, ask me for that but I'll, I'll give you a place you can ask me for that discord I do have a discord server you can join the discord server you'll have to agree to some behavior rules but that's reasonable you have to do that to be able to chat here too um, but if you join our discord server you can either look for Matariki the seven kites of Matariki is the name of the book in the book channels um, and there will be a link there for it or you can just ask in the general chat and we will give you the link for the YouTube video if you want to watch that um, so books Matariki oh yeah I was going to tell you about codex because I read um, public domain books so down here if you're watching on Twitch you'll see the logo for codex um, codex is a group of public domain book readers they read book, people who read books that are public domain books public domain means that they are no longer within copyright so we are not stealing someone's income from selling or renting out their books um, I believe in people being paid for the work that they do you like to get paid for the work that you do so why can't other people so here you go here's codex's discord server and if you look in my on my about page on twitch um, which if you're on YouTube you can come to my Twitch channel because there's a link on YouTube for my Twitch channel um, go to my about page and in that section there is is um, it looks like a, a portion of a typewriter uh, with those that word their codex on it and there's information written underneath with links to all of the different codex readers on Twitch that you can then go and follow and um, listen to some more readers which I will get on to doing in a minute. Reading, that is. Um, reading's good for your brain. So, yeah, 
Good. So I think that's enough of the general palaver. Um, I'll give you my three tips that I always give new new um, viewers. First tip, make sure you have something to drink handy. First tip, drinks. Second trip, tip, snacks. Third tip, comfort. So comfort, I have my lovely scrunchy cushion. Yay, tips, says Jonathan. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's a great way to keep me focused. Um, Snacks, I have cheese, which is wonderful, wonderful. Oh, no, no, not quite. It's going slightly oddly green. My green screen sometimes picks up on yellow cheese as being green and tries to show the picture behind through the cheese. But I also have some organic licorice. Yummy, if you like licorice. Uh, drinks, back to tip number one. Drinks, I always have water because water is great for your brain. It keeps it working and also your body. Although what you'll see me drinking from is not this because this tips over very easily, but rather this, which you'll see me slurping on. But I've also, for drinks, I also have a homemade iced coffee, which is a double shot of espresso with cold full cream milk and topped up with a little bit of cream as well. Very, um, if you like coffee. And if you can tolerate dairy, but very nice. Uh, right, so how about we get on with reading? Yeah, we're currently reading the book called The House of Arden by Edith Nesbitt, E. Nesbitt. Um, it's about the, a brother and a sister who, the brother has inherited the title of the Lord of Arden, or Lord Arden, and with it comes a castle, a house, and I'm not quite sure what else, but they are trying to, as is the way with Ms. Nesbitt's books, the children are trying to find the family treasure, what has happened to it. So there's all sorts of adventures going on. This book, a little bit like the last one of her books that we read, which is called The, the, the Amulet. The Story of the Amulet. That's the words for it. The Story of the Amulet. Um... This one also involves a little bit of time travel, but I, it, it, it works in a whole different way. It uses a different mechanism in the story. So it's always intriguing to find out what she's going to put into the stories. And usually there's a lot of historical basis to the stories. Uh, one of the things that I have found intriguing with reading her books is she often references places um, in, in the various books that she's written that... Rudyard Kipling also referenced in either Puck of Pook's Hill or Rewards and Fairies, which also had this time-travelling factor to it. Although in the, his books, it was more so that the children in the books, his books, would actually be learning a little bit of English history as part of it. Um, whereas um, Ms Nesbitt's ones are not so much to teach English history, although it is based in English history, but for the purposes of the story, it's so that the children can actually learn a little bit about their family background or um, the object, like the story of the amulet. It was, the, it was the object of the amulet. They were trying to find where it had been so they could find the original full, full, whole, unbroken version of it to restore it so they could get their heart's desire, which was to have their mum and their dad and their little baby brother back home with them because they were missing them. Anyway, so intriguing that, that both authors actually cover some of these same um, aspects of story, but done in very different ways and for different purposes. Anyway, so let's get on with reading. The children in the story are currently based at the the inherited castle, which has a house built kind of attached to the ruins and it talks about this garden which is why I've got this background behind me so you've got ruins here you've got a house through the other side of this wall here and this is a bit of a wild garden and then over on this part here you've got lawns and trees and all that sort of thing and it just really reminded me very strongly of um, the of what the setting is for where the children are so last chapter we had was where the sister had done a little bit of travel but the brother hadn't and for him she was she said something to him and then she said something more to him and she had just come back from the travel for her for him no time had passed 
So we shall carry on and find out what's going to happen next. So here we go. I'm Jeff. I'm reading The House of Arden by E. Nisbet. And we are reading chapter six. Yes, this book has chapter numbers. And this chapter is called The Secret Panel. Oh, that sounds intriguing. And I'm just trying to check. Yes, I have actually got my microphone going. I know that's a bit late to be checking, but yeah, I'm just trying to go through my checklist of things I was meant to check. My checklist. Oh, my phone is talking. Sorry, I'll just make sure that that's on silent. I don't know why that was up. I don't know. I don't usually turn the sound up on my phone. Right. Chapter six, the secret panel. Here we go. Where shall we hide him? Elfrida asked impatiently. I've just got a feeling that maybe we have to go back to the end of the last chapter. We, this book, I haven't had to do this with her other books, but this book, we seem to need to know what was happening in the last chapter before we go into the next one. I'll read the last paragraph of our, from our previous reading. Then let's help him, said Elfrida, and perhaps it'll be your, your doing that he is king. This is James. Her history had never got beyond Ed Edward IV on account of having to go back to 1066 on account of new girls. Yeah, so new girls come to the school and they have to go back to 1066, the Battle of Hastings, William the Conqueror, blah, 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 and work their way forward through history. But they haven't got this other information in, in history for her to remember. So that's what that's referencing. So, on account of new girls, and she'd only heard of Prince Charlie in ballads and storybooks. And when he's king, she said, I'll make you, he'll make you, no, this is what, Ed, her brother, I can't remember her names, but her, her, his name, that will come up in a minute. And when he's king, he'll make you dowager duchess of somewhere and give you his portrait set in diamonds. Now, don't scream, he's outside, I'll call him in. Where can we hide him? Oh, okay. That was Elfrida actually talking to her. The lady thinks she's a cousin, but it's kind of like a grandmother or great-grandmother or several generations back relation. Mm. So, this is talking about this prince, Prince Charlie, Prince Charles, and we'll find out what's going to happen. So she's still back in history having her adventure that her brother is not having because he's holding time still by sitting on the clock, which is made out of daisies on the lawn, on the lawn, down below the, the clock tower. No, down below the tower that you come into the castle courtyard through. So, chapter six, the secret panel. Where shall we hide him? Elfrida asked impatiently. This is Charles. Where are they going to find, hide Charles? Now, you might be starting to get a few clues as to which part of English history this is. I'm pretty sure that Jonathan has some idea of when this is. Cousin Bet, fired by Elfrida's enthusiasm, jumped up and began to finger the carved flowers above the chimney piece, feeling these carved flowers. Have you ever been in an old house and the actual walls, the wood of the walls, is carved into patterns and pictures and things like this? I have. It's most intriguing. Uh, unlike us where we just have ornaments, knickknacks, poked around on shelves or pictures nailed to the walls. So she started looking over the carved flowers above the chimney piece. The secret room, she said, but slip the bolt to and turn the key in the lock so that others can't open it. The door to the room that they are in so nobody else can get in, I'm thinking. Elfrida locked the room door and turned to see the carved mantelpiece open like a cupboard. Oh, I think that was a bit sneaky to get Elfrida to not see what the catch was to open this secret door. Turn to see the carved mantelpiece open like a cupboard. Then Elfrida flew to the window and set back the casement very wide. That's the, the, the portion of the window that opens. Opened up the window. And in climbed the beautiful gentleman and stood there very handsome and tall, bowing to Miss Betty, who sank on her knees and kissed the white jeweled hand he held out. Quick, said Elfrida, get into the hole. There are stairs, said Betty, snatching a candle in its silver candlestick and holding it high. Oh, here we go. Here's a picture. I've got some pictures. Hang on, let's find them. Illustrations. There you go. There's a gentleman stepping in through the window. 
here he is he's coming in through the window and this must be cousin bet and this must be elfrida she's holding up the candlestick because he's going to need it to be able to go down the stairs and i think this might be the door to the cabinet but i'm not sure it's a little bit hard to pick i was just looking at the picture to see if i can figure it out so betty handed them the candle that's him the candle so that's what that caption was for that the chevalier saint george sprang to a chair and got his knee on the mantelpiece and went into the hole just as alice goes through the looking glass in mr tenniel's pictures picture so um one of our early books was alice's 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 adventures through the looking glass i think is the proper name of it or something like that by 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 you know you know who it is by um lewis carroll is that the one anyway i'm terrible with names today i don't know what it is i've had this all day today anyway so in that one we actually had some of the illustrations she's referencing here um there was a chap his surname was tenniel t-e-n-n-i-e-l and the character the illustrations he drew for alice in wonderland and alice's adventures through the looking glass or alice through the looking glass are iconic they are the ones that most people think of when they think of the illustrations in those two books um the normal people like alice have slightly larger heads than normal but they're very very stylized very much the the particular type of illustration you would recognize and so she's referencing here in this book those illustrations from this other book alice through the looking glass um as how this prince is going into the cupboard so he's climbing stepping up climbing up onto the mantelpiece above the fire and then leaning forward to go into this cupboard where he's going to hide i hope there's a bit of room in there right so um went into the hole just as alice goes through the looking glass and mr tenniel's picture betty handed him the candle which his white hand because he's a gentleman his white hand reached down to take because he's up above them and he's reaching down to get the candle in its candlestick then elfrida jumped on the chair and shut the panel leaped down and opened the room door just as the maid reached its other side with the supper tray she would have been wondering why the door was locked so it was good timing when the cousins were alone bet threw her arms round elfrida don't be afraid little cousin she whispered your cousin bet will see that no harm comes to you from this adventure because this was seen as a very treasonous thing to be actually hiding and supporting um king charles i'm guessing this is which king charles is it hmm. you can look that up actually right i will oh, no, blah, 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 blah. that was not there at all well i do think said elfreda getting out of the embrace most promptly a thoroughly modern child who was not into getting hugs when it was me let him in and you'd have screamed the house down if i hadn't stopped you oh, yeah, elfreda knew all about what was going on kind of and here's here's her cousin betty telling her i'm going to look after you you don't need to be worried she wasn't worried stop chattering child said bet drawing a distracted hand over her pretty forehead and let me set my wits to work how i may serve my king i said elfreda scornfully should give him something to eat and see that his bed's aired but i suppose that would be too vulgar and common for you because cousin bet has already complained about vulgar and common people and elfreda hadn't realized just how how um snobby some people could be i think the two looked at each other across the untasted supper impertinent chit said bet chit yourself said elfreda then she laughed come cousin bet she said your uncle's away and you're grown up i'll tell you what to do you must be wise and splendid so that your portrait will be in the illuminated christmas numbers in white satin and with an anxious expression the savior of her king that's what it'll say because Elfreda comes from the era where they had um before the days of the um children's annuals style of book um they had 
magazines that would come out, periodical magazines that would come out in the, in the special editions, such as Christmas. They would have extra special illustrations in them, things like that. And I'm just going to go and get one of the one of the other ones. I think I have one of the, the boys' annuals or something like that, and I'm going to show you. That's the only reason I'm interrupting this. But just stay there. I'll be back in a minute. Um, I am just going to mute this because it'll be rattly. Oh dear, oh dear, I cannot find the book. I don't know where it is. I did see it recently. Maybe it was down at Dad's. Anyway, doesn't matter. Right, I'll show it to you sometime when I find it. I have a range of those. I know where it is. It's downstairs, which is down two flights of stairs, and they're very long, so I'm not doing that because I'll be out of breath by the time I come back, and you'll have to wait too long. So I'll carry on reading. So she's talking about if you do the right thing, then you will be remembered well and you'll even be put into the, the children's magazines or the magazines of the day, you know, with printed illustration and things like this. I don't know if this is something that Cousin Bet will understand, but we'll find out. Don't wander in your speech, child, said Cousin Bet. No, she hasn't a clue. Pressing her hand to her brow. Oh. I'm guessing it's actually like this, but she seems such a dramatic sort, pressing her hand to her brow. <sighs> I've enough to distract me without that, and if you desire to ask my pardon, do so. Oh well, I beg your pardon. There, said Elfrida with extreme irritation. Now, perhaps you'll give your king something to eat. Climb into that hole with a tray, and the servants perhaps coming in any minute, what would you say to them if they did? All right, then I'll go, said Elfrida, only too glad of the chance. Don't forget, she's already spent time with this chap because he was the high woman. Bet touched the secret spring, and when Elfrida had climbed into the dark hole, which she did quite easily, handed her the supper tray. Oh, Bother, said Elfrida, sit setting it down at her feet with great promptness. It's too heavy. You'll have to come down and fetch it. Give me a candle and shut the panel and tell me which way to go. To the right and up the steps. Be sure you kneel and kiss his hand before you say a word. Because that's what you did with kings, with royalty, that sort of thing. Elfrida reached down for the candle and its silver candlestick. So that's two candlesticks missing from the room. Is this going to be significant later on in the story? Oh, and by the way, if you wish to do a puzzle, type an exclamation mark, puzzle, and you will be able to play this game here. Sorry, this game here. Yes. And I shall just move this over here so it's out of my way. Um, but you don't have to. That's just there in case you want it. Right. To the right and up the steps, be sure you kneel and kiss his hand before you say a word. Elfrida reached down for the candle and its silver candlestick. The panel clicked into place. She maybe, maybe should have asked how to open it. Don't know. Uh, the panel clicked into place and she stood there among the cobwebby shadows of the secret passage. So that apart from the prince, there's not been a lot of people going through here recently, which is a good thing. The light in her hand and the tray at her feet. It's only a mouldy warp magic adventure, she said to hearten herself. Turned to the right and went up the stairs. They were steep and narrow. At the top she saw the long, light line of a slightly opened door. 
To knock seemed unwise. Instead, she spoke softly, her lips against the line of light. It's me, she said, and instantly the door opened and the beautiful gentleman stood before her. The secret room had a little furniture, a couch, a table and chairs, all old-fashioned, and their shapes showed beautiful, even in the dim light of the two candles. Your supper, said Elfrida, is at the bottom of the stairs. The tray was too heavy for me. Do you mind fetching it up? This is to the prince who's used to everybody doing everything for him, such as her cousin has spoken of. If you'll show me a light, he said, and went. I think he's quite amused to be able to just sort of partake of more normal life than normal, than typical. You'll stay and eat with me, said he, when she had lighted him back to the secret room, and he had set the tray on the table. I mustn't, said Elfrida. Cousin Bet's such a muff. She wouldn't know where to say. I was... If the servants came in, oh, I say, I'm so sorry I forgot. She told me to kneel and kiss your hand before I said anything about supper. I'll do it now. Nay, said he, I'll kiss thy cheek, little lady, and drink a health to him who shall have thy lips when thou art seventeen, and I am, what was it, five hundred? Two hundred and thirty, said Elfrida, returning his kiss cordially. You are nice, you know. I wish you were real. I'd better go back to bed now. Real? said he. Oh, I'm talking nonsense, I know, said Elfrida. I'll go now. The absent tray will betray you. So he's someone who actually thinks well about the consequences around him, unlike Cousin Bet. The absent tray will betray you, said he, taking food and wine from it and setting them on the table. Now, I'll carry this down again. You have all the courage, but not quite the cunning of a conspirator. How long are you going to stay here? Elfrida asked. I suppose you're escaping from someone or something, like in history. I shall not stay long, he said. If anyone should ask you, if you have seen the king, what would you say? I should say no, said Elfrida boldly. You see, I can't possibly know that you're the king. You just say so, that's all. Perhaps really you aren't. So she's able to say no and come across like she's telling the truth. That's a good point. Exquisite, said he. So you don't believe me? Oh, yes, I do, said Elfrida, but I needn't, you know. Slife, he said, but I wish I were. There'd be a coronet for somebody. You wish you were? Safely away, my little lady, and as for coronets, the jewels are safe. See, I have set them in the cupboard in the corner. And he had. Then he carried down the tray, and Elfrida, who was very hungry, tried to persuade Bet that she must eat, if only to keep up her strength for the deeds of daring that might want doing at any moment. But Bet declared that she could not eat. The least morsel would choke her, and as for going to bed, she was assuring her cousin that she knew her duty to her king better than that, and that she would defend her sovereign with her life if need were when her loyal ecstasies were suddenly interrupted. She really needs to get a hold on herself, this girl. Really doesn't understand the danger she's putting everyone in by being so dramatic. Sorry, coffee time. Oh, nice. For the quiet of the night was broken by a great knocking at the castle door and the heavy voice of a man crying, Open! In the Queen's name! The Queen. Mm. They've come for him. All is lost. We are betrayed. What shall we do? said Bet. Eat, said Elfrida. Eat for your life. You've got to make it look normal. She pushed Bet into a chair and thrust a plate before her, put a chunk of meat pie on her plate and another on her own. Get your mouth full, she whispered, filling her own as she spoke. So full you can't speak. It'll give you time to think. Good point. Mm, yummy. Yummy licorice. If you're in New Zealand and you like licorice, then look for... I'm going to find a nice clean label to show you. Yes, it's very rattly. Look for this. See if you can see it. Organic, natural, 
tweet and then it says maku jaku and then a picture of a green leaf made out of stars original finnish black licorice mm, i'm thinking it's made in finland <laughs> yummy i'm not going to try and read all that because i don't read finnish but you can get it in New Zealand. I got it from our local bin in and it's very yummy. Sorry, carry on. Distracted by food. Funny that. So full you can't speak. It'll give you time to think. That's wise. And then the door opened and in a moment the room was full of gentlemen in riding dress with very stern faces and they all had swords. Hi Q, great to have you here. Hope you're feeling a bit better today. There's a jigsaw puzzle if you want to play it. Just type in jigsaw, exclamation jigsaw or puzzle or whatever. Elfrida, whose mouth was equally full. No, 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 I missed a bit. They all had swords. Betty, with her mouth quite full, was trying not to look towards the panel. Elfrida, whose mouth was equally full, looked at the gentleman who seemed to be leading the others and remarked, This is a nice time of night to come knocking people up. Hang on, I'm just trying to see if I'm meant to give you a picture yet or in a minute. Right, in a minute. Sorry. All hours are alike to a loyal subject, said a round, fat, blue-eyed gentleman in a green suit. Have you any strangers under your roof tonight? Oh, cried Bet, all is lost. She's daft. The gentlemen exchanged glances and crowded round her. Elfrida shrugged the shoulders of her mind, if a mind has shoulders, and told herself that it didn't matter. History knew best, no doubt, and whatever seemed to be happening now was only history. You have a stranger here? they asked. And where is he? You cannot refuse to give him up. My heart told me so, said Bet cried a bit. I knew it was he you were seeking. And with that, she fainted elegantly into the arms of the nearest gentleman. <sighs> so dramatic. <laughs> Who was dressed in plum colour and seemed to be struggling with some emotion which made him look as if he were laughing. <laughs> Ask the child. Children and fools speak the truth, said the flat, fat, Sorry, not flat. The fat, blue-eyed gentleman. Elfrida found herself suddenly lifted onto the table. There you go. Here's your picture. Um, there you go. There she is. All of them in their wonderfully ornate outfits with powdered wigs and everything. And here she is. They've stood her on the table, Elfrida. <laughs> I'm just going to see if I can see. No, they don't show her cousin Bet fainted. Elfrida found herself suddenly lifted onto the table from which she could see over the heads of the gentleman who stood all around her. She could see Bet reclining on the sofa in the open door with servants crowding in it, all eyes and ears. Now, said a dozen voices, the truth, little miss. What do you want to know, she asked, and in a much lower tone, I shan't tell you anything unless you send the servants away very appropriate in this context very appropriate indeed that the servants do not actually hear something that is so important good move girl good move right carrying on i shan't tell you anything unless you send the servants away the door was closed and the truth was asked for again. If you'll only tell me what you want to know, she said again. <laughs> She's a pretty smart cookie, this one. Sorry, I'm just doing a little... I know, I'm being very distracted today. It's really not something I want to have happening, but that's the way it is. Right. If you'll only tell me what you want to know, she said again, does any stranger lie here tonight? 
No, said Elfrida. She knew that the beautiful gentleman in the secret chamber was not lying down, but sitting to his supper. But Miss Arden said all is lost, and we knew twas he whom we sought. Well, Elfrida carefully explained, it's like this. You see, we were robbed by a highwayman today, and I think that upset my cousin. She's rather easily upset, I'm afraid. Very easily, several voices agreed, and someone added that it was a hair-brained business. The shortest way's the best, said the plum-coloured gentleman. Is Sir Edward Talbot here? No, he isn't, said Elfrida downrightly. And I don't believe you've got any business coming into people's houses and frightening other people into fits, and I shall tell Lord Arden when he comes home, so now you know. Zooks, someone cried. The child's got a spirit, and she's right too. Strike me if she isn't. But snails, exclaimed another, we do but protect Lord Arden's house in his absence. If, said Elfrida, you think your Talbot's playing hide-and-seek here, and if he's done anything wrong, you can look for him if you like, but I don't believe Lord Arden will be pleased, that's all. I should like to get down onto the floor, if you please. I don't know whether Elfrida would have had the courage to say all this if she had not remembered that this was history times and not now times, but the gentlemen seemed delighted with her bravery. <laughs> they lifted her gently down and with many apologies for having discommoded the ladies, they went out of the room and out of the castle. Through the window Elfrida heard the laughing voices and clatter and stamp of their horses' hooves as they mounted and rode off. They all seemed to be laughing, and she felt that she moved in the midst of mysteries. She could not bear to go back into her own time without seeing the end of the adventure, so she went to bed in a large four-poster bed with Cousin Bet for company. We've had this in other stories. In other generations, it was quite normal to share a bed with other people. So that's what that is. Um... The fainting fit lasted exactly as long as the strange gentlemen were in the house, and no longer, which was very convenient. Elfrida got up extremely early in the morning and went down into the parlour. She had meant to go and see how the king was, and whether he wanted his shaving water first thing, as her daddy used to do, but it was so very, very early that she decided it would be better to wait a little. The king might be sleepy. And sleepy people were not always grateful, she knew, for early shaving water. Found that one out the hard way then. So she went out into the fields where the dew was grey on the grass and up onto Arden Knoll. And she stood there and heard the skylarks and looked at the castle and thought how new the mortar looked in the parts above the living house. And presently she saw two figures coming across the fields from where the spire of Arden Church rose out of the tops of the trees as round and green as best double-curled parsley. And one of the gentlemen wore a green coat and the other a purple coat. And she thought to herself how convenient it was to recognise people half a mile away by the colour of their clothes. Ooh, these might be a couple of these guys coming back to check. Quite plainly, they were going to the castle, so she went down too and met them at the gate with a civil, Good morning. You are no liar bed, at least, said the green gentleman, and so no stranger lay at Arden last night, eh? Elfrida found this difficult to answer. No doubt the king, king had lain, probably was still lying in the secret chamber, but was he a stranger? No, of course he wasn't. So, no, she said. And then through the open window of the parlour came, very unexpectedly and suddenly, a leg of a riding boot, then another leg, and the whole of the beautiful gentleman stood in front of them. So ho, he said, speak softly, for the servants are not yet about. They are, said Elfrida, only they're at the back. Creep along under the wall and you'll get away without them seeing you then. Always a wonderful counsellor, said the beautiful gentleman, bowing gracefully. Come with us, little maid. I have no secrets from thee. So they all crept along close to the castle wall, to that corner from which, between two shoulders of down, that's these big hills in the south of England, you can see the sea. There they stopped. 
So it sounds like these two gentlemen are friends of his, not ones who are trying to catch the king to turn him into the enemy. And the wage is mine, said the beautiful gentleman, for all you tried to spoil it. That was not in the bond, Fitzgerald, entering Arden at night at nine of the clock to ferret me out like a pack of hounds after Reynard. Reynard is a nickname for the fox. There was nothing barred, said the green gentleman. We tried waylaying you on the road, but you were an hour early. Ah, said the beautiful gentleman, putting back clocks is easy work, and the ostler at the bull loves a handsome wager nigh as well as he loves a guinea. I do wish you'd explain, said Elfrida, almost stamping with curiosity and impatience. And so I will, my pretty, said he, laughing. Aren't you the king? You said you were. Nay, nay, not so fast. I asked thee what thou wouldst say if I told you I was King James. So he's playing with words as much as she has been. Then who are you? she asked. Plain Edward Talbot, baronet, at your ladyship's service, he said, with another of his fine bows. I wonder if this Edward Talbot is a real historic character, figure. Uh, someone can look that up if they want. But I don't understand, she said. Do tell me all about it from the beginning. So he told her, and the other gentlemen stood by laughing. I'm going to write his name down now. Edward Talbot. There you go. Maybe I can look him up later. And he's a baronet. Did you find out about mangle woozles? Did I tell you what they were? Because I did say that I knew what they were. Did you find out what they were? All those other plants that we were going to look up. I'm going to carry on with the story now. So he told her and the other gentlemen stood by laughing. The other night I was dining with Mr Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald here and the talk turned to highway robbery and on Arden Castle here with other matters and these gentlemen with the others of the party laid me a wager, 500 guineas, it was, that I could not rob a coach. I took the wager and I wagered beside that I would rob a coach of the Arden jewels and that I would lie a night at Arden besides. And no one should know my name there. And I have done all three and won my wager. I am but newly come home from foreign parts, so your cousin would not know my face. But Zounds, child, had it not been for thee, I had lost my wager. I counted on Miss Arden's help, and a pale-faced, fainting, useless, fine lady, I should have found her. But thou, thou'rt a girl in a thousand, and I'll buy thee the finest fairing I can find next time I go to London. We are all friends. Tell pretty miss to hold that tongue of hers, and none shall hear the tale from us. But all these gentlemen coming last night, all the servants know. The gentlemen came, no doubt, to protect Miss Arden, in case the villainous highwayman should have hidden behind the window curtain. Oh, but the wise child it is, has a care for every weak point in our armour. Then he told his friends the whole of the adventure, and they laughed very merrily for all they had lost their wager, and went home to breakfast across the dewy fields. It's nice of him to think me brave and all that. Elfrida told herself, but I do wish he'd really been the king. When she had told Betty what had happened, everything seemed suddenly to be not worth while. She did not feel as though she cared to stay any longer in that part of the past, so she ran upstairs through the attic and the pigeon noises back into her own times and went down and found Edred sitting on the second hand of the daisy clock. And he did not believe that she had been away at all, for all the time she had been away seemed no time to him, because he had been sitting on that second hand. So, when the Mouldiwarp told them to go along in, they went, and the way they went was not in, but out, and round under the castle wall to the corner from which you could see the sea. And there they lay on the warm grass. And Elfrida told Edred the whole story, and at first he did not believe a word of it. But it's true, I tell you, said she. You don't suppose I should make up a whole tale like that, do you? No, said Edred. Of course, you're not clever enough, but you might have read it in a book. 
You're not clever enough. <laughs> She's two years cleverer than he is. Well, I didn't, said Elfrida. So there. If it were really true, you might have come back for me. You know how I've always wanted to meet a highwayman. You know you do. But how could I come back? How was I to get off the horse and run home and get in among the chests and pigeon noises and come out here and take you back? The highwayman, Talbot, I mean, would have been gone long before we got back. No, he wouldn't, said Edred obstinately. You forget I was sitting on the clock and stopping it. There wasn't any time while you were gone, if you were gone. There was with me, said Elfrida. Don't you see? There wouldn't have been if you'd come back where I was, Edred interrupted. How can you be so aggravating? Elfrida found suddenly that she was losing her temper. Remember this was all meant to be, the children were meant to be working on not arguing with each other, otherwise Mouldy Warp was not going to help them. You can't be as stupid as that, really, said Elfrida. Oh, can't I, said Edred. I can, though, if I like. And stupider, much stupider, he added darkly. You wait. <laughs> this is a funny, funny challenge to put out. Edred, said his sister slowly and fervent, fervently, sometimes I feel as if I must shake you. You daren't, said Edred. Do you dare me to? Yes, said Edred fiercely. Of course, you are aware that after that, by all family laws, Elfrida was obliged to shake him. She did, and burst into tears. He looked at her for a moment, and, but no, tears are unmanly. The era of the book, sorry. Um, that's just the way it is. Um, tears are unmanly. I would not betray betray the weakness of my hero. Let us draw a veil or take a turn around the castle and come back to them presently. It is just as well that we went away when we did, for we really turned our backs on a most unpleasant scene, and now that we come back to them, though crying is still going on, Elfrida is saying that she is very sorry, and is trying to find her handkerchief to lend to Edred, whose own is unexpectedly mislaid. Oh, all right, he says, I'm sorry too. There, but us saying we're sorry won't make us unquarrel. That's the worst of it. We shan't be able to find the door for three days now. I do wish we hadn't. It is sickening. Never mind, said Elfrida. We didn't have a real I'll never speak to you again, you see, if I do quarrel, did we? I don't suppose it matters what sort of quarrel you had, said the boy in the gloom. Look here, I'll tell you what. You tell me all about it over again, and I'll try to believe you. I really will. On the honour of an Arden. So she told him. All over again. And where, said Edred, when she had quite finished, where did you put the jewels? Good question. Oh yes, here we go. Here's the next illustration. Elfrida was obliged to shake him. They're sitting by the corner of the castle. She's grabbed hold of him and she's shaking him. That's her hat that's starting to come off. He's not impressed. <laughs> Oops. My chair just ran over the corner of my long cardigan. Don't really need to wreck it since it's new. Right, we'll carry on without the illustration distracting us. Um, I just need to tell somebody else uh, about something they've got to keep an eye out for. Right, carrying on with the story. I, they, he put them in the corner cupboard in, a sec in the secret room. If you'd taken me and not been in such a hurry, no, I'm not quarrelling. I'm only reasoning with you like Aunt Edith. If I'd been there, I should have buried those jewels somewhere and then come back for me and we'd have dug them up and beyond, been beyond rich been rich beyond the dreams of, what do they call it? But I never told Betty where they were. Perhaps they're there now. Let's go and look. Oh, that's a good thought. The jewels were stolen. Elfrida was the one who went with Talbot. 
Yes, Edward Talbot, and saw where they were put in the secret room, not Betty, unless he went and told her later on. But I never told Betty where they were. Perhaps they're there now. Let's go and look. If they are, said he, I'll believe everything you've been telling me without trying at all. You'll have to do that, if there's a secret room, won't you? Perhaps, said Edred, let's go and see. I expect I shall have got a headache presently. You didn't ought to have shaken me. Mrs. Honeyset says it's very bad for people to be shaken. It mixes up their brains inside their heads so that they ache. And you're stupid. I expect that's what made you say I was stupid. Oh, dear, said Elfrida despairingly. You know that was before I shook you, and I did say I was sorry. I know it was, but it comes to the same thing. Come on, let's have a squint at your old secret room. But unfortunately, it was now dinner time. If you do happen to know the secret of a carved panel with a staircase hidden behind it, you don't want to tell the secret lightly, as though it were the day of the week or the date of the Battle of Waterloo or what it, whatever nine times seven is, not even to a grown-up so justly liked as Mrs. Honeyset. And besides, a hot beefsteak pudding and greens do not seem to go well with the romances of old days. Beefsteak pudding, it's a stew. But it's possibly done with dumplings or a pie topping. Let's look it up. Food is always appealing. Mmm, it's basically stewed beef, but, uh-huh, yeah, it's kind of like a pie cooked in a pudding basin. It's a pie, kind of, I'll show you a picture, just because I find it quite intriguing. Let's find the right place to put this picture, like we have done before. Find the right folder, and then we shall open it up in the Oh hang on, what what is it? Oh, that means I've got to edit it. Save it as a different file type because of what it is. And then we can do it. Just because food is important and it can be, yeah, I, I can see now why they would have, um, called it <coughs> an important thing to not interrupt. That's what I'm trying to get at. Sorry. Getting there. It's just I've got to save it twice. Specific books. That's the folder. Then the author. Then the book. Which is that one there. Save. Right, now I can show it to you. It's not like something I can just drag and drop it for you. Otherwise, I would have. There. Yum. Not particularly the type of yum flavor. Here we go. This is a beefsteak pudding. This one technically is... Come back here. Where did you go? I have no idea where it disappeared to. We'll try it with a different image placeholder. I was trying to get it so it was big enough. For some reason, this is doing weird things when I um, enlarge pictures. 
and do it a piece at a time so it doesn't go and disappear and choose it for you there you go beefsteak pudding so it's made in a pudding basin which is why it's got that almost conical or slightly rounded shape with a flat bottom because originally a, a pudding basin is a, a bowl that's this shaped with a flat bottom and then it has either you put a cloth over the top and you tie the cloth on a pudding cloth sometimes you have a pudding cloth inside it and you tie it together at the top um, you can also put um, baking paper over the top and tie that on or you can actually have a lid that fits onto it to stop water getting in and so you put the pastry lining inside the bowl with the stew mix inside it so this one is actually a steak and kidney pudding but you can also do just a steak one um, so it's got vegetables and gravy and meat and then you put it inside the the um, pastry shell effectively um, that's inside the pudding basin Put the lid on, whichever way you're doing the lid, and then you put it into a saucepan of boiling water, or you bring it to the boil, and then you boil it for a certain amount of time, and it cooks the outside part, but it also heats up the inside. Very, very yummy. A little bit like having a meat pie, but without doing it in a pie dish in the oven, you're actually doing it on a stove top. So we shall get that one out of the way, and get this one ready. Not the one that disappeared. Just as well, I didn't use that format, didn't I? right <sighs> so that was the extra for today was beef steak pudding which is effectively steak and kidney pudding not necessarily with a kidney though right so, and besides a hot beef steak pudding and greens do not seem to go well with the romances of old days yeah so you might as well enjoy the meal while you've got the meal and then get a knock on with enjoying the story afterwards to have looked for the spring of that panel while the dinner smoked on the board, steamed away on the, at the table or on the sideboard, would have been as unseemly as to try on a new gold crown over curl papers. They don't go together. Curl papers are like hair curlers, the way they used to do it. Elfrida felt this, and Eldred, Edred did not did not more than half believe in the secret anyway and besides he was very hungry i can believe that i'm starting to get hungry too wait till afterwards was what they said to each other in whispers while mrs honeyset was changing the plates you do be you do do beautiful cooking edward remarked as the gooseberry pie was cut open and revealed its chrysoprase colored contents there's a word for you chrysoprase do you know what chrysoprase is? I'm looking it up for you. C-H-R-Y-S-O-P-R-A-S-E. Chrysoprase is a gemstone, a type of chalcedon, chalcedony, chalcedony. Um, it's a form of silica. It has small quantities of nickel and the color is normally apple green. It's a very pale apple green but it can vary into deep green the darker varieties are also referred to as price chrysoprase so i don't know if you're familiar with traditional gooseberries so this would be the chrysoprase color is because it's just the intensity of the green of cooked gooseberries in a gooseberry pie now i'm in new zealand and i'm used to Chinese gooseberries and Cape gooseberries. They are not anything like traditional green gooseberries that you get in England. Um, and they've got their name because they are either the shape of them, Cape gooseberries, or the color of the inside, Chinese gooseberries, also known as kiwi fruit. It's the greenness, which is um, in early days could sometimes be used as a I don't know, a pie filling or something like that. So that's why she's talking about this chrysoprase colour. Um, you do do beautiful cooking, Edred remarked, as the gooseberry pie was cut open and revealed its chrysoprase coloured contents. You do the beautiful eating then, said Mrs Honeyset, and you be quick about it. You ain't gotten to no mischief this morning, have you? You look as though butter wouldn't melt in either of you's mouths, and it's always a sign of something being up with most children. <laughs> she knows children. 
No, indeed we haven't, said Elfrida earnestly, and we don't mean to either, and our looking like that's only because we brushed our hair and wet, with wet brushes, most likely. It does make you look good somehow. I've often noticed it. Stops your hair going all fluffy all over the place. I've been flying around this morning, Mrs Honeyset went on, so as to get down to my sister's for a bit this afternoon. She's not so well again, poor old dear. I might be kept late, but my niece Emily's coming up to take charge. She's a nice, lively young girl. She'll see to your she she'll get you your teas and look after you as nice as nice. Now don't you go doing anything as you wouldn't if I was behind of you, will you? That's dears. Nothing could have happened better. Both children felt that Emily, being a young girl, would be more easy to manage than Mrs Honeyset. As soon as they were alone, they talked it over comfortably and decided that the best thing would be to ask Emily if she would go down to the station and see if there was a parcel there for Master Arden or Miss Arden. Getting her out of the house. Sneaky. And if there was, and if there isn't, Elfrida giggled, we'll say she'd better wait till it comes. <laughs> Very sneaky. We'll run down and fetch her as soon as we've explored the secret chamber. I say, Edward remarked thoughtfully, we haven't bothered much about finding the treasure, have we? I thought that was what we were going into history for. Now, Edred, said his sister, you know very well that we didn't go into history on purpose. No, but, said Edred, we ought to have. Suppose the treasure is really those jewels. We'd sell them and rebuild Arden Castle like it used to be, wouldn't we? We'd give Auntie Edith a few jewels, I think, wouldn't we? She's such a dear, you know, said Elfrida. Yes, she should have first cho choice, I do believe. We're on the brink and I feel just exactly like as if something real was going to happen. Not in history, but here at Arden. Now, Arden. I do hope we find the jewels, said Elfrida. Oh, I do, and I do hope we manage the lively young girl all right. Uh, don't know if she's going to be as young as they expect. Mrs Honey... Honeyset's best dress was a nice bright red, the kind of colour you can see a long way off. Mm, how convenient. They watched it till it disappeared round a shoulder of the downs, and then set about the task of managing Emily. The lively young girl proved quite easy to manage. The idea of popping on her hat and running down to the station was naturally much, much pleasanter to her than the idea of washing the plates that had been used for beef steak steak pudding and gooseberry pie, and then giving the kitchen a thorough scrub out, which was the way Mrs Honeyset had meant her to spend the afternoon. Well, when, when the people of the house have told you to go and do something, then you do that as a priority above what your, your um, aunt, mother, whoever it is, has, has told you to do. Her best dress she had slipped the skirt over her print gown so as to look smart as she came up through the village, was a vivid violet, another good distance colour. It, was, it also was watched till it dipped into the lane. And now, cried Elfrida, we're all alone and we can explore the great secret. But suppose somebody comes, said Edred, and interrupts and finds it out and grabs the jewels and all is lost. There's tramps, you know, and gypsy women with baskets... Yes, or drink of water, or ask the time. I'll tell you what, we'll lock up the doors back and front. They did, but even this did not satisfy the suddenly cautious Edred. The parlour door too, he said. So they locked the parlour door. <laughs> Mrs Honey says going to come home and wonder why the house is completely locked up. So they locked the parlour door and Elfrida put the key in a safe place for fear of accidents. She said, I do not at all know what she meant, and when she came to think it over, she did not know either, but it seemed right at the time. Oh dear, have they now gone and lost the parlour key? Is that going to put something forward to happen in the future? They had provided themselves with a box of matches and a candle, and now the decisive moment had come, as they say about battles. Elfrida fumbled for the secret spring. How does it open? asked the boy. I'll show you presently, said the girl. She could not show him then, because in point of fact, she did not know 
She only knew there was a secret spring, and she was feeling for it with both hands among the carved wreaths of the panels, as she stood with one foot on each of the arms of a very high chair, the only chair in the room high enough for her to be able to reach all round the panel. Suddenly something clicked, and the secret door flew open. She just had time to jump to the floor, or it would have knocked her down. Then she climbed up again and got into the hole, and Edred handed her the candle. "'Where's the matches?' she asked. "'In my pocket,' he said firmly. "'I am not going to have you starting off without me again.' "'Well, come on, then,' said Elfrida, ignoring the injustice of this speech. "'All right,' said Edred, climbing on the chair. "'How does it open?' He had half closed the door and was feeling among the carved leaves as he had seen her do. "'Oh, come on,' said Elfrida. "'Oh, look out!' Well might she request her careless brother to look out. As he reached up to touch the carving, the chair tilted, and he was jerked forward, caught at the carving to save himself, missed it, and fell forward with all his weight against the half-open door. It shut with a loud bang. I've got a picture for you. No, not that one. The next one. Oh, dear. He's shut himself out of the, the adventure. There's the chair falling over, there's Edred, and it's because he was determined to find what the catch was and where it was. Oh dear, I think Edred's got a few things to learn, hasn't he? It shut with a loud bang. Then a resounding crash echoed through the quiet house as Edred and the big chair fell to the floor in so to speak, each other's arms. There was a stricken pause, then Elfrida from the other side of the panel beat upon it with her fists and shouted, Open the door! You aren't hurt, are you? She hasn't got the matches. Yes, I am, very much, said Edred from the outside of the secret door and also from the hearth rug. I've twisted my leg and the knickerbocker part and I've got a great bump on my head and I think I'm going to be very poorly. Well, open the panel first, said Elfrida, rather unfeelingly, but then she was alone in the dark on the other side of the panel. I don't know how to, said Edred, and Elfrida heard the sound of someone picking himself up from among disordered furniture. I hope he hasn't broken the chair. Feel among the leaves like I did, she said. It's quite easy. You'll soon find it. Silence. That's the end of the chapter. It's also the end of today's reading. And the next chapter is equally as long. So I'm sorry. You'll have to come back on Friday to hear the rest of the story, won't you? The rest of the chap the, the next chapter. But I will give you a teaser. Chapter 7 is called The Key of the Parlour. Mmm. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. I think they're getting themselves into more scrapes. <gasps> Oh my goodness gracious me, what are they doing, these children? <sighs> They're going to get in trouble with Mrs Honeyset if, they, if she comes back and the house is completely locked up. Elfrida is missing and they can't find the key to the parlour. I think they're in the parlour. Oh dear. I wonder if she can find her way up the stairs. And to the right and up the stairs, up the stairs and to the right in the secret passage and find her way to that room. And I wonder if it has any light in that room, if there's a window or a skylight or something. Intriguing, incredibly intriguing, and I so want to carry on reading, but I can't because it's just going to take too long, and there's so many other things I need to do, and also we still need to have more to look forward to in the book. I'm just going to have a quick look here. Let's see how many chapters the book has. One, two, three, four. Oh, hang on, it's got a number here. It's got 14 chapters, and we are going to be reading chapter 7 next. There you go. So we're halfway through the book, basically. <sighs> what goofs. Yes, absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Do you think by the end of this book, these children are going to manage to get on with each other without actually arguing all the time and telling each other that the other person is being stupid and I'm smart because that's basically what Mouldy Warp, the Mouldy Warp was telling them that they had to get on well together otherwise they wouldn't be able to do anything 
Mm. Anyway, hopefully, usually there's a little bit of that sort of change happens with the characters in our books, like um, the Bastable children learning that they need to, to, there are consequences to what you wish for. No, was that the Bastables? The Samiad series, sorry, not the Bastables. The Bastables were the would-be goods and the, and the treasure seekers. Um, the, the, the Samiad series, yeah, the children were learning that you need to actually be very specific and think carefully about what you actually wish for and that there are consequences to everything that you wish for as well. Oh, goodness me. Anyway, so good to have you here. Thank you for being here. And I do hope, Q, that you are getting a bit better and that the heat isn't overwhelming wherever you are. Somewhere in North America, I know, north of that border. Yes. Um, so good to, like I say, great to have you here. If you are, have, have arrived late, I'm really, really sorry about that. You're most welcome to watch the video once I have signed off here. It will be available to you. And if you are watching this on YouTube and you've, you've landed on this story, this, this video, but you haven't heard the rest of it before now, then if you're able to see this on YouTube, you can go back to the beginning of the playlist and actually start watching it from there. It's quite intriguing. I really do enjoy um, Edith Nesbitt's story writing style and her, her um, perspective on what children are like. Uh, they seem to be based a lot more on what, how, how children, on the reality of children rather than some idealized form that some of the other authors tended to come up with in their time in their day and age. So I think she was quite revolutionary in that respect, which is intriguing. So anyway, we shall see you next time. I look forward to it. Remember, three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 3 p.m. New Zealand time. And if you're on Twitch, it will show you on my schedule what days I am live and what the time zone is for where you live. Um, don't forget to follow me um, because that means that Twitch will tell you if I am live. Um, and if you can afford it or if you've got an um, Amazon Prime subscription and haven't yet used it, you can actually subscribe. There is, you get one free subscription per month through Amazon Prime, which I would love it if you did want to subscribe to my channel, but you don't have to. That's entirely up to you. If you're watching on YouTube, please um, subscribe to my channel there. That does not cost you anything. It's like a follow on Twitch. Um, and then you, if you click the bell notification, YouTube will actually show you or tell you every time I put a new story online, a new reading online. And they're basically the, exactly the same as what I read on Twitch, except there's no interaction um, for you on what, when I'm live, which is what does happen on Twitch, like, Q is talking to me at the moment, uh, saying that you, she's got a slow recovery and the heat is still nasty. It rained today and she wishes it would keep raining. Yeah, definitely, if that helps to bring down the temperature. Uh, don't forget to keep your um, um, putting a cold cloth on your, especially on your forehead, but also a little bit of cold under your arms apparently can also help, but then holding your arms up so the air dries out that moisture that helps to cool you down. Um, all of those sort of things, look after yourselves. Uh, YouTubers, um, come back and see the different posts that get put up, the different um, videos that get put up. I put them into playlists. If you've missed out on previous ones, go to my playlist page and find those. Don't you, You're most welcome also to leave comments, um, preferably nice ones. We try to keep it nice around here. Um, it's a it's a family friendly channel, both on Twitch and on YouTube. And you can you're most welcome to also join me on um, Discord, and I'll give you that link just in case you haven't already. Um, and then you can just be you can chat with me. You can tell me about books that you've loved, old books that you've loved, and even make suggestions about books that you, that you think would be interesting for us to read. But just keep in mind they do need to be public domain. Anyway, see you next time. Great to have you here. Look forward to seeing you again for more stories, especially this one from the House of Arden. I'm loving this story even more than any of the previous ones. See you next time. In the meantime, happy reading. Bye.